Good morning. I'm Carla Jones. For those of you who don't know me, I am a uh, coordinator for staff development within the Division of Student Life. And we welcome our friends from Academic Affairs as well to join us this morning as Dr. Fred Newton talks about retention. Fred Newton is the past director of counseling services and a professor of counseling and ed psychology at Kansas State University. At the University of Missouri Columbia, he received an EPDA, Education Professions Development Act Fellowship, while completing a doctorate in counseling psychology. He also has a master's degree in student personnel services from Ohio State University. Dr. Newton has had a career including teaching and coaching in the public schools, serving as a director of a community recreation program, and directing the student activities program at a community college. He has held a faculty position in the Department of Counseling and Human Development at the University of Georgia and was coordinator of career counseling and an associate professor of education at Duke University. He has been active as an author and researcher, author or co-author of five books or manuals, contributed chapters to 17 professional books, and written over 60 articles for professional journals. Other professional contributions include over 100 presentations to professional and other public audiences. He has been involved in international presentations in Europe and Asia, and has publications that have been printed in Japan and Australia. Over the past 30 years, Newton has served as a training consultant to students and staff in over 50 college settings, including colleges in the UK, Portugal, Romania, Taiwan, and Japan. He's helped establish workshops and training programs in areas of leadership, organizational development, student academic success, and the use of peer education training. He's been involved with the implementation of six grant programs sponsored by foundations and federal government programs. Currently, he is director of Kansas State Comprehensive Assessment Tool, Inc., a nonprofit corporation that develops and distributes assessment instruments for measuring input and outcome variables on student success. One instrument, the College Learning Effectiveness Inventory, or CLE, is now being used at 10 beta user institutions and currently is being used for research studies at four additional institutions. Dr. Newton has been recognized for excellence in his teaching and service contributions to professional associations. He received the annual Cuptus Award from the American College Personnel Association, the Walter Morris Service Contribution Finalist by the Kansas State Foundation, and Emerging Entrepreneurs Finalist by Commercialization Leadership Council of Kansas State Research Foundation. He is the author of this book, Students Helping Students, a guide for peer educators on college campuses, second edition. I'm proud to introduce my colleague. I've known of Fred Newton for 30 years. I have been honored to work with him for the past 17 years through his role at Kansas State. And this project came about because our staff development committee has asked Dr. Newton to do some presentations on his work as he is in the process of retiring um, however, he's still here, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity to spend time with my colleague and my friend, uh, Dr. Fred Newton. Please welcome him warmly. Well, I guess that what that proves is if you live long enough, you get a few things done, but uh, <laughs> I've lived a long time. Uh, process of retiring, huh? Well, <laughs> it's a difficult process. Uh, uh, I've made my first steps. I'm on phased retirement, and uh, the way I look at it, I, I, I describe it as my bucket list. There's certain things I've wanted to finish off, and so I'm trying to get these projects done. And some of what you're going to hear today is part of my bucket list. Uh, retention is going to be the overall theme, but I'm really wanting to look at it from a K-State perspective. Uh, we're also going to look at it as some research that has been done here but also from a pragmatic side, uh, what can be done in terms of one aspect of retention, and that's the area where I'm supposedly uh, the expert, and that's the personal development side. So uh, retention does involve a lot of personal development factors, so I am going to talk a little bit about the college learning effectiveness inventory. And then I want us to kind of, and I say us, I want us to kind of look at what we've been doing on this campus, whether it fits with some of the principles of retention, 
uh, kind of let it become a discussion, actually, with you folks. And I, I know we have representatives from all aspects of the campus here, which I think is, is great. And uh, so I hope it provides a stimulus. I would like it to go from presentation to discussion. Uh, I know we have approximately an hour, so I'm going to try to keep my, my PowerPoint slides to containment. So if I start running off, let me know. Say, oh, whoa, whoa, because uh, probably, you know, when I start talking about these things I'm fairly passionate about, I can go on for quite a while. So uh, uh, maybe starting out with that golden egg type thing, uh, I kind of put this idea together that in some ways the bottom line is retention is so important, it's like searching for something very special. And so that whole metaphor of finding the goose that laid the golden egg seemed like that represents it in some way, except I tried to use that in uh, a proposal to a conference coming up and uh, someone took offense that students wouldn't like being called a golden egg. And I said, well, maybe, <laughs> and that is a problem, maybe I need to change my metaphor. But anyway, you're going to get that same metaphor today. Uh, why is it important? Uh, these are points that I uh, think are pretty self-evident. It's certainly a reflection of what we're doing in education. You know, people come to school with the idea that they're going to accomplish something, and the most visible outcome is to get a degree. So we kind of want them to survive. We want them to get something added. We want them to finish. So it's, you know, most people do come to school with the idea that they're going to get some kind of certification. And so uh, that would be something that we would want. It's also a big investment. Uh, anybody that has kids in college now, I know, I, we know it from just working with students, but when you start paying for students going through college, that's a whole other issue. This is, you know, this is mortgaging your house so that they can get through. Uh, but also, it's, it's evidence when students are retained and succeed and move on that we are doing what we're supposed to do. And the we is the faculty, the staff, and this includes all staff, because I think classified staff and, and peer educators are a part of that process. And finally, it, han it enhances our reputation. And you know, one of the things that we, K-State University, is looking toward right now is getting that North Central uh, evaluation complete and showing that we have done well. And one of the things they're going to look at is our outcomes. And finally, the bottom line is we lose students, we lose money. And as I say at the bottom, uh, you all know our state situation, golden eggs are hard to come by these days. Now, there are some pitfalls for retention. And I, I picked this up, uh, kind of adapted it from an article that came out this past year. Uh, in the About Campus Journal. Uh, the article was entitled, Getting Serious About Institutional Performance in Student Retention. And these are five pitfalls that uh, they identified. Uh, one is, they say, campus-wide efforts are very difficult to coordinate. We all have a job to do. We all know that we are a part of the whole. But it's real difficult to not have redundancy, to have overlap. Uh, maybe we even are counterproductive that one group is doing something that maybe counteracts what another group is doing. And uh, because we all are out there doing our thing, it can be confusing to students as to where to go for what. Uh, the other factor is, and, and I'll show you some research on this, but retention, and I'm putting its counterpart attrition, you know, retain or lose, we're actually looking at both sides of the same particular coin, although there are some little differences. Why students leave is not always consistent with some of the things that can help them stay here. But uh, it's a very complex situation, uh, and it includes some things that are very difficult for us to put our hand on, especially when I get to what I call the psychosocial or personal factors, which we will talk about more. Um, I think we need better input measures, and this is what was outlined in this article. In other words, we need to do a pretty good assessment as to what the students' needs may be uh, and what some of the problems may be that have them leave school. And we need to target those. So really, good, in, good data in helps us do things that are relevant and appropriate and efficient. And then on the other end of it, we need good outcome measures to know exactly what we do and which ones work, which ones have an impact and how we can, again, prove that we're doing what we say we're doing. Uh, you know, that uh, point five, which I guess you can't see the numbers there, 
says that we're organized, you know, that we've always been called, uh, given kind of, a, I, I guess it would be a criticism that the university is a lot like a bunch of silos. We all operate within departments and agencies. We all have objectives and goals. But I said, you know, this is kind of an interesting metaphor. You, you know, in our, in our business world, we have drug stores that sell groceries and clothing and grocery stores that sell drugs and hardware and hardware stores that sell candy bars and clothing. Uh, in some ways, we resemble that kind of issue. Uh, we all are dabbling in a lot of things, and it overlaps a lot. And do you go to the grocery store or the hardware store, and, and kind of how do we get coordinated so that we can maybe uh, eliminate some of the overlap, and maybe the, the big key is not compete for resources and delivery of services. Uh, so I think that's a fairly relevant article. Now, I think you all know that the President has come out with Case Day 2025, and he has several benchmarks. And of course, which is one of the benchmarks but retention. And as you see on this slide, this is straight from his uh, PowerPoint slide, that K-State is kind of at the bottom in terms of sister institutions or comparative institutions in terms of our freshman to sophomore year retention rate. And it's similar when you look at the graduation rate, which is six, usually used in a six-year. And I'll, I'll mention that again, too. So here we are uh, with the three-year average, 2006-2008, at approximately 79%. And uh, you know, someone like Iowa State, a very similar school, is about 5% higher. So the implication, of course, is the president would like to see us increase this. So uh, what do we know about retention and persistence? And the teeter-totter is we can go from either side, you know. It's, it's, it's one or the other, and both of them are important to look at both sides of the teeter-totter. Uh, this is from Gary Hansen. Now, Gary Hansen is someone I'm pretty familiar with. He's a well-known researcher, uh, and he actually is in charge of institutional research for the University of Texas system. So he's looking at all the different types of schools under the University of Texas system. And he makes this statement. Retention to graduation is the result of a complex set of factors that vary by individual student and individual institution. And due to this complexity, it is unreasonable to expect an increase in one or two years of more than one to three percent. So with all our efforts, you know, here's someone that really knows. Uh, and if, uh, I don't think Mike Lynch is here right now, but you know, Mike has all this data over years and years, and our retention rate has varied one or two percent. But you look at it over a 10-year period, it's the same. It goes up one year and down one year. So basically, that one or two can be uh, you know, almost a, just a variation that's very typical. But if you stay consistent, uh, someone like Gary Hansen is saying the best you can do is maybe expect a 2 to 3% increase with a very consistent, concerted effort. So uh, don't expect miracles. Whoops, one wrong direction. Now, I think most of you uh, realize this. Because retention is important to universities, we're getting a lot of private sector people trying to come in and, you know, they'll do a lot of things for you. So it's not a good idea to read, but this is, this is an email. I get about, you know, I, don't, I think I'm not atypical. I bet all of you get these emails. I get about five to six emails a day from private companies promising that they can do something for you to increase your retention. So this is yesterday. And this is a very personal letter, I want you to know. It says, hi, Fred. I hope you had a great week and a relax going into the holidays. Christmas shopping is wearing me out. <laughs> I promised additional information about the retention solution that we offer to institutions when I emailed you last week. I didn't realize we had a personal email last week either. As I was going over notes from the conference, so they got my name from a conference I'd been to, I started thinking about how faculty are being pressured to increase retention at institutions. This is so stressful. Ferris Resources would love to make your job easier and to start a conversation about how we can partner with Kansas State University to increase its retention rate, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, people are out there really wanting to get into this business, and there are millions of dollars uh, being put into it. And I don't know how much money we're putting into it, but I know we have contracts with quite a few companies that are basically promising that they can help us out. Now, 
that's not bad. We may want to go out and buy some of these things, but I think uh, let the buyer beware is, is what I would say. And there's some pitfalls to it, but also you don't want to reinvent the wheel, so there's some reasons to get these. So I think that's, again, just another factor. Uh, if, you, if you look down at point three there, a uh, 4% increase in K-State freshman to sophomore retention would mean a couple million dollars in our pockets, easily, just in one year. And if you just had a 2% increase and you kept those people for the next three years, uh, you'd get $3 million. So there are reasons to invest in this, and that's the golden egg again. So uh, the question I, I put out there, I pose, and I don't have the answer for it, are we using our financial resources wisely to get the best return, whether we go to the private sector and let them do things for us, or whether we do it ourselves and come up with a concerted effort. It's a, it's a tricky question, but it's a money question. Okay, I want you to look at this. This was a study done here at Kansas State of why students left, 998 students, practically 1,000 students, and these were their top reasons for leaving in order of the proportion. They left to take a job, they didn't have adequate finances, the courses were not what they wanted once they came here and took them, marriage, and number five was academic dismissal, and then a kind of a big general category, just dissatisfied. Now, if you notice at the bottom, this study was done in 1949. So it's not today that we started worrying about retention. So way back in the hinterlands. Now, this was study, uh, I don't know if this has even been published yet, but Kelly Cox and Chris Fiat and Yun Hee Kim, who was working with our office last year, and she's gone on to be an institutional researcher in Ohio now. This is what they looked at a predictive model for second year persistence of first time freshmen on a 2008 cohort group. So we have this data uh, and the variables that you see that they were looking to make comparisons with to see if there were any predictive uh, predictors in the group were gender, ethnicity, generation as in first or, or second generation students, residency, geographic region they came from, pre-college achievement, ACT scores, financial status, parent income, and on scholarship or not. So 2,742 students in 2008. And these are the predictors they found that first generation students were 34% less likely to be able to be maintained. And we've known that, right? We have programs for that. That's why we've had them for years. Uh, those that come in with GPAs below an A from high school we're talking about can be predicted to be less, and, and I'm going to get into more detail about this, but this is our data here. 53 to 78 percent. Now, why it's a, it's a range is there's different grade point averages, those between, say, 2.8 and 3.2, those between 2.5 and 2.8. So that's why, but the lower the grade point average, the, the lower the prediction for them to stay. ACTs, again, uh, this is the comparative mode here, is those above 27 percent are the comparison. Uh, but ACTs 21 to 27 percent are 39 percent less likely, and if you get below 21, as much as 50 percent less likely to be retained. And I'll, again, I'll show you more about the academic uh, achievement factors and the ability factors. But financial need unmet. So in other words, uh, if it is greater than 30 percent financial need that's not met, there's a 44 percent less chance that they will maintain. If parent income is less than 42,000, there's a 33% chance. And uh, again, this is, uh, this is the material Mike Lynch puts together for the Regents Group study. Um, and the last cohort that's been here six years would be like 80, or 2003. Yes? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. That's okay. Well, many of these are admission standards, yeah. Right. Some of these are just, are just data we have, like are they on scholarship or not. Right. But I guess thinking that other institutions with higher admission yeah, I'm gonna, standards. I'm going to point to that in just okay. a second. All right. I think, I think that will answer your, what you're kind of making a suggestion here. Uh, so if you look at our graduation rate in the last five years in which they've gone had an opportunity to graduate within six years, 
our average is about 58% of those students who come here end up eventually graduating. So here's the way I do it, and I, and I think this maybe will get kind of to what we're talking about. This little pie chart up here says what are the predictive variables? Can we categorize them? And so this first area is what we call achievement and ability, which is exactly what you're talking about. This is how we determine selection, or at least get this data before they come in. What are their high school grades? What's their ACT scores? And this has been done. I can show you data that goes back into the early uh, 20th century. So uh, we know that those predictors, so exactly what you're saying, if you get the top 3% in terms of ACT scores and high school grades, you have a good chance of keeping them. And so Harvard has about a 95% retention rate. Selective schools don't worry about much else because they've already selected people that are likely going to be A, motivated, and B, succeed because they have all it takes and more. So I think that's, that's an issue. And then so you get the schools like us, which we kind of have selectivity, but we also have flexibility. And uh, we, I guess we would no longer say we were completely open door, but if you graduate with credits in certain classes in the state of Kansas, you do have an open door chance. Uh, so the big red portion, which looks a little more than 50% there, but typically in the prediction formulas, over years, it's been something like 40 to 55 percent, somewhere in that range. The, the easiest predictor for whether someone will proceed throughout their college years. Uh, it also can be used, and we do a lot of that here, is for placement. If we know what they're capable of doing in certain specific areas, that we can put them at a level that they're more likely to succeed. So it can be used once they get here. Uh, and so what do we do? Well, we've always done quite a few things, and we still do quite a few things based upon their achievement and their ability. And we put them in the appropriate level classes. We give them supplemental education, which the Academic Assistance Center has been doing that for 20 years. Uh, we provide tutors, study sessions, study tables. We try to improve our teaching when we do a lot in that area. Um, and we really need to challenge students to reach higher, and, and that's where I, you know, I like some of the things like the, the McNair uh, scholars and, and those kind of people that get challenged to do more because they can do more. So I'm not going to dwell on this, though. <laughs> this is out there. This has been out there for years. So that's a given. Well-prepared, intelligent, capable students are going to do well. The next group is I call a 10 to 15 percent of the pie, and that little yellow piece there. And I call that circumstance variables. You know, they, these are things that have come to people because of the family they lived, they were born to, because of the region they came from, the high school they attended, uh, and all of these kind of various things. Uh, work hours can be a circumstance. Now, I know in uh, Kelly Cox and, and uh, Yun Hee Kim, when they looked at ethnicity, ethnicity by itself does not predict. You know, it's fairly neutral. But by ethnicity, if you look at socioeconomic level and you can look at some of the back, that is what hurts many minorities. It's not the color of their skin, it's the circumstances of their situation. So what do we do to enhance area two? Uh, we do a lot of things, and, and I gave just, I'm probably sliding people here because there's a lot of you who are doing things because you know they have circumstances. Financial aid, based on circumstances for the most part. The TRIO programs, adult student programs, uh, academic assistance, International Student Center, all these, disability support service, all these are there because of circumstances. So we have in place a lot of possibilities to help with that percentage of the pie that causes retention problems. Now here's where my strength comes in. Psychosocial variables. I think it's hard for us to grapple with psychosocial variables. I think because, uh, you know, they seem intrinsic, they seem personal. Uh, and how do you know what a person's motivation is? Well, you can kind of tap that. Uh, are you aware of what some of their behaviors and habits are? 
Uh, how about their attitudes? You know, so these are areas that are important. But you know, uh, this is where we started research uh, with a group of people. And I, and I don't know if I can even tell you all the people that have been involved in this research looking at psychosocial variables. But we've had a lot of people involved for about the last 20 years looking at how can we impact those personal reasons why students leave and how they can be more successful uh, on our campus. I also have, because we've looked at that, over in my office, I have two big binders, three-inch binders, completely filled with articles and research on psychosocial variables. And we've now written four articles that we've got published based upon what we've done here. So all I'm saying is there's a lot of data out there, but it's still difficult to get our handles on many of these things. So self-efficacy, uh, I mentioned that because that always is very high. Self-efficacy is the Bandura concept, which basically says, yes, you're confident that you can succeed, but it's, it's more than that. It's you're confident that you can apply what you've known in one area to another area. You can problem solve. And you feel like people, you have the support, you have the wherewithal to tackle even problems that are unknown to you in the past. Uh, our data says that self-efficacy, many freshmen come in feeling like, yeah, I can handle college. And they come in with a pretty high level of self-efficacy. However, the second area, which I'll show you some research on this, how well are they organized, how well they plan, how well do they have a schema in which they can put it together and prepare themselves to tackle problems. And if they don't have that, their self-efficacy after the first semester goes down because they all of a sudden have feedback that you weren't so hot after all. So they start out believing they can do it. So there's actually an inflated self-efficacy. And eventually, uh, they have to prove it by what their actions are. However, I say self-efficacy is a necessary condition. If you go and start school and you don't believe you can handle it, you can't handle it. So uh, you know, it's self-fulfilling prophecy. But connected with organization and planning, you can't. Again, I'm going to give you a little more data on this. But the emotional and personal management, we have all kind of data on sleep. About 40% of our students do not get sufficient sleep and how that affects their performance. And we'll also show on health behaviors. And I'll, I'm going to give you a little bit more on that later. And you get down to emotion, emotional management and involvement and engagement, which a lot have been written about that also. These factors don't necessarily correlate with grade point average, but they do correlate with enjoyment of being on campus and participation. And that's a motivational factor. So satisfaction is very high in correlation with these bottom two. And then finally, uh, this is one as we get into our studies. We didn't particularly pick out how well they acted in the classroom or with faculty, but we find that that is an important variable. So again, as you look at that pie, uh, amazingly enough, about 30% of how or why students succeed is due to personal factors. So if we can tackle that, if we can help students, then we can supply them with some tools that they can then more likely succeed. Uh, and the thing that's really important is point two is this is something they can do something about. You know, you can do ACT preparations and maybe raise your scores a little bit, but you're really not going to change dramatically your basically brain tools that you were brought into the world with. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can't, and you usually can't change your financial status. That you have within yourself ability to change your attitudes your uh, dispositions or your emotions and your behaviors or your habits. Those are things that you, as an individual, can change. And finally, there are methods that we can use to do that. So this is a very simple you know, problem solving. And so the group that I've worked with has come up with this simple process. It's nothing, nothing spectacular. It says, first of all, you've got to know, you've got to explore, you've got to find out things about yourself. So what is it that's going wrong, and how can you change that? You have to then apply it to yourself. You have to understand the consequences of that. And then you've got to take some action. And so 
the simplest way of calling this uh, model, uh, when, I, when, I, when we presented it in the book Students Helping Students, for peer helpers working with other students, we said it's simple as what, what is going on, so what, what does it mean to you, and now what, what can you do about it? That's the simplest model you can have. And so the details can be, can be elaborated upon. However, the script at the bottom says, an important point to emphasize when working with personal factors, the, you're, when you're dealing with an individual, is the individual differences and the complexity of situational and personal factors together. So it's more of a process rather than a set formula. So in other words, each individual is a creative complex of characteristics that include emotions, habits, background, disposition, and abilities. And they're in different situational areas. So you've got to consider that as a whole. So you can't just give them all the same treatment. They're all a bit different. So that makes it seem like, anyway, it's going to be difficult because we don't have enough time. Advisors, do you have enough time to give an hour or two to each student uh, every two or three weeks so that you can really help them explore? Counselors, you know, we're overwhelmed or would say, hey, we need about five more counselors. And so I think that it becomes a problem because to be effective, you have to know these people. So, or have to get them ready to know when to get to seek help. Okay, now I'm jumping to what's the first stage assessment. And uh, we, this generic we, again, involves probably a number of people, like maybe 20 or more people got involved in this. Uh, decided way back, it's been about 15 years, that when we were working with these students uh, that were somewhat at risk or had needs, that we needed to have a way to kind of pinpoint what their concerns were. So we came up with what we called this instrument in which students would put in responses and we could get back some ideas of where they had needs. Now, it isn't easy to develop an instrument, I find out. <laughs> First of all, we started with a theory. I'm going to give you a real quick overview because I don't want to take too much time. I want to have a discussion. A uh, quick overview was uh, we had a theory that said these are important psychosocial variables. Then we took a group of about seven people working with college students in this realm, including counselors and advisors, and uh, we brainstormed 300 items. And then we looked at these items and judged them as to where they fell in a continuum of positive qualities to negative qualities. And they had to be consistent. So anyway, to make a long story short, we came up with an instrument called Equal Appearing Intervals. And it had uh, two basically balanced instruments, so a Form A and a Form B. And we went through all that. So we got it down to 160 items. And we found out, hey, that's helpful. But then we said, you know, it's still unwieldy. So we went back and we did a factor analysis of the items. And we found out that we did find that there were about six scales or six factors. So I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, so it gave us feedback on what the students' strengths and weakness input could be in variables that we thought were important. And it also could be useful then when, when we work with students. So students could see it and get ideas. We could work with students through advising or counseling or other ways. And so our result has been we've actually now have this instrument online. Any student can take it at any time through University Life Cafe. They have a Discover Yourself, a place where they can go in and do it. And we've had over 3,000 students here at K-State take this instrument now, about 1,700 in the last two years. Again, these are the six scales. Uh, you have that in your handout. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I've already kind of indicated these have some validity as based upon the literature and all. And they have validity based upon our psychometrics in developing this instrument. So where we are with it now is mostly on this campus. Uh, we're using it for orientation in some cases. Uh, it's been used on other campuses. We have about 10 institutions now using it. We have a site where we can basically provide it to other institutions for a fee. Uh, we haven't really marketed it. It's been advertised through some of the articles, but so people have come to us basically to find this. And we call them beta users because they're still kind of working with us in, in how it may be useful. Uh, so some people are using it in orientation and initial advisement. Some people are using it with at-risk groups and probation. 
So I know Jonathan's been using it with, with our, uh, some, some of the classes we're now uh, operating from to try to improve students that are in academic difficulty. Um, and we also have at least six studies going on, four of them from off campus. Um, a couple community colleges, actually community colleges are on the forefront of doing some of this type of work. And uh, two private colleges just came up and, and are, are doing data on it. I'll show you the data from one of them. And we actually had this translated and used in two foreign countries already. And as a result of this, uh, we decided not only do you have to have the survey and the inventory giving you information coming in, but you ought to have some strategies to work with it going out. So these materials are workbooks that we have that can be used in class or groups or individually with students. And, and these are pretty hot off the press. Uh, the final product, I won't know, say this is even final, uh, was just developed by August of this past year, of this year. And uh, so we're now using it. Some of these outside groups uh, are, are asking for copies. And so I have an order for about 150 copies to go to one institution, and we're going to use it here on this campus. So I'm trying to find a publisher right now. I mean, we can always go to a vanity press, but we're trying to get a major publisher. To, and they're looking at it. So who knows? Maybe we'll get it out there. Uh, but what have we found out? This is the crux of what I want to get to. Uh, this is our work with a study of 579 freshmen, 2008, here on this campus. So again, we have six scales which is on the left side. We have their grade point average, first semester and second semester of their freshman year. And we have a variable called life satisfaction, which again is measuring how satisfied, how happy, how content are these students uh, here on this campus. And there was another instrument, persistent, uh, they're, they're kind of an instrument that kind of says, are you planning and what's your motivation to carry on? Uh, on the right side, that's another instrument which I'm not even going to talk to you about but that we're developing called the PASS. The PASS means uh, personal attributes and social support. How well do they see themselves with personal attributes and how much do they use social support? Maybe a good instrument. We're kind of in baby stages with that. Uh, but what you see is, and these are not correlations, these are R squared. So in other words, this is the variability that can be attributed to these factors. And self-efficacy and organization attention to study are right up there. These are our predictors. However, how well they handle stress and how satisfied they are and how engaged they are is how satisfied they are to stay. And that's an important variable for whether they persist. So uh, we do have that evidence. Uh, it is when you combine some of these together, managing that 25 to 30 percent possibility of how one can succeed. Now, also remember we did health behaviors, which is another psychosocial behavior. And some of you remember we had Pack Cats, and, and Pack Cats was a program with, again, freshman uh, first year experience classes. And uh, we wanted to see how they did when we measured, and we're still using this instrument too. Uh, in fact, we have over 4,000 students have used the Pack Cats since it was inst instituted. And again, using the regression model, we find some very interesting things. Alcohol consumption is an inverse correlation with grade point average, which we kind of intuitively know. And health behaviors, Bill's done sitting there smiling. He's been saying that for what? How many years, Bill? <laughs> uh, but that's pretty significant. So we're seeing negative reactions. People that are unhealthy are destroying their possibilities of succeeding. Uh, but again, if you look at like personal management skills, which includes such things as having problem solving, learning how to manage their stress, learning how to manage their time, has an almost 0.50 with life satisfaction. If you manage well, you are capable of feeling confident and happy being here. So again, health behaviors, very important. Now, this has been done. And so some controlled research was done. This is another institution. This is up in, in Moorhead, Minnesota. And 2006, 2007, they ran a program for their at-risk students. This is a small college. And this is their data of how they worked with those students. And they just had kind of a, a hodgepodge of things that might be useful to them. In 2008, they started using the CLE to pinpoint where they needed to work. And 2009, so first of all, they had the percent that returned the next semester. And you can see 
for the increase, which we really love to see that kind of results from our, from our instrument, and the percent returning the following year, which is even more significant. And if you read this person's comment, the 87% retention rate the following year with students that were at risk is greater than their retention rate for students in general. So I think that's amazing, actually. I'm, I'm glad they did it and not me, because I would say it's prejudice. Uh, this is another study we did here on this campus years ago. In fact, it came from architecture. <laughs> uh, and one of the problems years ago was, you know, that first year where they weren't really admitted to architecture, they were losing students that they had selected in. And so they wanted to do something with uh, having those students that were already identified in the first semester go through a program to try to help them improve and maintain themselves so they could go into degree years. And uh, what was interesting here in this study, and this is Lynn Awano was involved in doing this, uh, 114 students in two years did participate in a 10-week course to focus on how they could change behaviors to manage and improve what they were doing. Uh, but what we did was we matched those 114 students with 114 other students that had the similar major or similar class standing, the same grade point average gender, and they were either on status or not on status with probation. Uh, and these were the comparisons. The group that went through were 36% higher for getting off probation, 52% more likely to stay enrolled, and 33% greater rate of graduation. So, I mean, those are pretty significant pieces of data. And our conclusions were, you can use personal strategies for making. The, the model we used was small groups, so that these students had to decide, this is what I'll do, and they also were accountable for each other. So we used the peer group influence. And we even had a, an activity called judge and jury, which if someone came back and said, I'm going to get up at 7 o'clock three days this week and study, they were asked, did they do this? And they were encountered with a defendant <laughs> or a judge that would, would actually say, if you haven't done this, we're going to set up some means for you to do this. And they would actually assign another student to call them up at 7 o'clock in the morning the next week. So uh, we used peer influence on that. And we also said, rather than just each session having a topic, we did have some topics, but each session also started with, where are you with your goals? What are you going to do about them? How well have you succeeded? So it used that personalized method. OK, getting down to the stretch here. In five minutes, I'll finish this. This is what I have learned. <laughs> OK, I'll own this. Uh, you can assist students to improve their academic performance by focusing on personal factors. OK, I think we've established that. The actual areas that predict improvement include, and so again, self-efficacy, their per perception and attitude, study organization, their involvement, and their engagement, all these things I'm repeating, and their well-being, which oftentimes mean the absence of bad behaviors. Uh, OK, number three, and this came from my first doctoral student dissertation. She decided to look at persistence and an intervention program. She had these students. It wasn't here. It was at McPherson College. Uh, the president backed it, said, well, we're going to put them in groups or individual. And if you have this grade point average, we're going to see how well you did. Well, she got all this data back. And it showed progress. But there's a big variability in this progress. Like, you know, it, there, there's just too much variability. So we looked for variables that why did some of them not succeed as well as others? And we found one thing. Even though we had groups assigned and they had so many advising sessions, there was a certain number, about 25%, that did not show up for their appointments or only made two out of five or six classes. So that came to, and when we looked at that, that was, that was it. That was it. You can give them something. You can provide support, but they have to take the intervention. So you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. The fourth point, self-regulation. Again, it's better to have them learn to solve problems than you solving it for them. So almost all our PAC test was all designed on they make choices. The ABC program, which is still going on, is all designed on you get data, now you make choices, and you carry it through. Uh, fifth point, the greatest source of influence. We know that peers influence peers for better or for worse. And so, uh, so while they, we did this study a long time ago. When the tipping point came up, we tried to find the tippers and see you know, who are those influential students just generally on campus. Uh, and we found a lot of impact that they had. And then, of course, uh, using the trained peer, which again is 
I'm not gonna, that's another lecture on how you can get peers to help peers. I have, I won't, I won't read it, but <laughs> I have my opening chapter about peer counselors, and I go through K-State. And I say, you know, Joe College starts off by have meeting with an ambassador and getting a tour of the campus, and they go on to RAs, and they go to a financial assistance, and they go through a whole string, and, and within what would be one semester, this student has at least hit 13 different peers that he's working with or she's working with. So anyway, we use them on campus, and I don't know, I think we probably do a good job with them, but they are an asset. And finally, you can buy a lot of CAN programs or systems, but what works in one place will not necessarily fit in another institution with unique needs and institutional circumstances, which is not to indict that, you know. You just gotta pick out, and they're gonna sell, just like that letter I read, they're gonna sell you anything you wanna buy. So I think you need to be very careful about that. So, checklist, the factors I think make a difference. Okay, I think we need, I think we have a reputation for being a friendly atmosphere. That's necessary. That's not sufficient. Customer service is what makes a friendly atmosphere work. Quick, quick example. The other day, uh, I had an appliance and I bought it at this store, which is the friendliest store in the world. It does everything. They greet you at the door. They have 10 people looking at everything, you, every product in the house. But so we, we bought a uh, microwave, took it home, unpacked it, and it was the wrong color. Took it back and said, got the microwave, looks like what I want, but it's the wrong color. I spent an hour and a half trying to get them to exchange that. They tried to give me my money back. I said, I don't want my money back. I want my microwave. And we went through a whole rigmarole, and I saw somebody else there who had bought something from them online. They can't help you. We only help people going through this website, and then we have to have this. And the procedure was so cumbersome that I haven't been back to that store since. And they're one of the big name stores in town. And I say, the customer service was terrible. So it's more than friendliness, it's customer service. Uh, students involved in campus life, and we know this, this is engagement. And we do a pretty good job on this campus of engaging students. And of course, the leadership program is a prime example. Those students are going to stay. They're engaged. Uh, the third point, and we do have, we have great services, and we have the things that I think students like, whether it be recreation and so forth. Uh, community of learners, uh, I just throw that in there, and I'm not judging us one way or the other. I think there needs to be a congruence or consistency. That what they learn one place has to be reinforced in another place. And so I think we always need to look at that and work with that. Here's one I haven't mentioned, and we've done this in some of our studies. You need to account for student readiness. And I'm not going to get into, but we have good data to say, you know, there's a theory about readiness that goes from pre-contemplated, people who don't have a clue, but someone said, you, better, you don't need to see a counselor, you need to see an alcohol advisor, you need to go do this or that. But they haven't had a clue themselves. They just maybe have just the slightest inkling. Pre-contemplated. Contemplated, I think I need to do something. I'm not sure what it is. Planning, where I, I'm really wanting to do this. I'm ready to do it. If you don't put them, figure out where they are and get them where they are, you're not going to be very useful to them. And I don't think we do enough of that because we sometimes want them to be where we want them to be. And they're only at pre-contemplated. We can't get them into doing something at kind of a planning and action stage. So. Uh, and we found, the whole PACAT study, we found that to be true. It was important to move people from pre-contemplative to contemplative and not having them do something dramatic up here. The influence of peers, uh, again, that's, I'm a big advocate of that, how we can use that. I'm excited. We're probably going to do a program with uh, the leadership studies in which we introduce a class. It's going to be a little more generic. Uh, and we have some ideas about that. Uh, connection to resources, you know, we've changed. Uh, Pat, we had what, ULN, we had all these things trying to figure out how to connect and, and we're doing more things now online. How well are we working with that? How much, uh, University Life Cafe, we've put $175,000 from a grant into designing that. And we're trying to get students to see it and use it and make uh, advances because of that. And then the academic arena, and this is the interface between academics and us, we know. <laughs> that classroom engagement, whether it's research efforts, you know, our president's now saying we want to get undergraduates involved in research. I think that's a great idea. We just got to figure out how to do it. Because if they get involved, they're going to be tied into very action-oriented types of activities. Okay. 
Any, any recommendations? Well, you know, these are, are fairly simple. Pull the research that applies to this campus and glean from it what a set of goals and actions might be needed for retention. I don't know why I have two ones there. Uh, go beyond friendliness to customer service. <laughs> They're one and one. <laughs> and so, you know, how do we get the customer service? And I, when I say universal, I'm, th I'm thinking some of the people that are most useful to this are our classified employees because they see the students at the moment of entrance, you know, when, and they, when they share something. So I think we need to be fairly universal that we are efficient from any classified employee answering the phone to our peers. Uh, creating an edu educational environment that has congruence and can be perceived as nearly seamless in philosophy and values. I put in small print there, which you can hardly see. Why are Coach Snyder and, and, and Coach Martin good fits for this campus? Well, you know, we're a rural work emphasis. Put your nose to the grindstone and just try, try, try. Well, those coaches epitomize that. So they're good fits for our, our kind of our attitude here. Uh, use timely and accurate assessments for individual students in need. Of course, that's my promo. And prepare peer educators. OK, now I'm kind of uh, waiting for inputs. And I'll, we have a few minutes. Some of you may have to leave. I know at 11. but. I'd like to hear your ideas, your thoughts. I put down there, what's our report card, how well are we doing? But these are just provocative questions. So what, do you have, what, what thoughts do you have? How are other people doing some things that they see would contribute to this whole area of retention? And So it's, it's like an onion. You've got to peel back some of the pieces to kind of find all that's involved. Tom? Fred, I think if you go back to the first meeting and some of that, there are some institutional issues that we've not dealt with for about 15 plus years that until we deal with certain learning environments and the treatment of students, we're not, we can spend all the money we want on peer tutoring and everything else, but we've got to deal with those. I think Pat's aware of a couple of them, but uh, th that's part of my reaction on a report card. So you're saying that's a problem. Can you take it one step further, Tom, and say, what do you think some of the possible solutions? Do we need to have a summit, <laughs> or do we need to? Fred, we want to get better. Um, we, have, we have some systematic challenges, uh, but, but bottom line is, unlike other atmospheres and environments, I know we want to get better. Uh, Mike, is Mike here? Mike, uh, Mike presented to the deans and department heads yesterday, and Carla, Carla as well, that uh, over the last year, we've improved our freshman to sophomore retention rates by 2%. We went from about 78.5 to 81% of our freshmen become sophomores. Uh, and you look at in-state, we're at 82%. Now, I, I have to say, and Carla and I have had this discussion, with all the programs that people in this room and others have implemented over the last couple of years, something has stuck to the ceiling and we've done a better job. Now, it might be because we've talked about it, 
and maybe it's in spite of the programs we put in place, but think about all the programs we placed the last couple of years specifically in response to, to, to Fred's, uh, Fred's concerns and other, other people outlining our interests. I, what I don't see there, Fred, is what's happened with the economy. That, that as uh, this morning I had breakfast with about 30 student leaders. And once again, when we talk informally about what, what, what we hear from our students, it is the fact that it's very difficult for some of our students to make it back second semester or the second year, <coughs> both in-state and out-of-state. That, that, that's an overriding concern mm -hmm. that I think we have to put in a place that, that I'm not sure, and it's, you know, I'm the guy with the glass always being half full. I, I'm not sure we can get ourselves in a position where we can affect more than 2 to 4% of our, our retention mm -hmm. freshman to sophomore. To be realistic, and I, I know it's going to be out and people go, oh, well, Bosco, uh, 2 to 4%. If we were 83%, 84%, if I dare say 85%, that's between 60, 60 and 120 students for the freshman year out of a freshman class of about 3,600. Um, we lose now about 19%. If we can get that down to 17, 16 percent, um, I think it would be part of the, part, responding to some of the issues you have here, including some of the systematic challenges we have. Uh, so I don't want to get us to the point where we leave this session feeling like, woe's me. I think what we're doing is extraordinary. We went through $22 million worth of cuts, and we still care, care today more than ever before. Our programs dealing with targeted areas have been stronger on the backs of the people in this room, the people that you represent. I hear that. So as, as we think about this, I, I, I do want us to continue to try to be intentional. And we are meeting in small groups with our academic community, with the provost, uh, 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 collaboratively, collaboratively with our faculty and academic deans to try to come up with a plan to, to work for that, now I'm the first, the first time we're talking about that 2 to 4 percent, but I, but I think that's what we have to think about realistically as a K-State family. And Carrie, it's in part of what's input. I mean, we're, I, I don't want to, I mean, maybe there's someone else in my role that will say, well, we need, to, we need to get a smarter freshman class. I'm not one of those people. I, I, I think that the, the, the nature of our school, the fabric, the brand of our school is for opportunity, particularly for students in our, our state. That, that's part of our culture. Now, we don't throw them to the wolves. We have an academic assistance center. We have a pilots program. We have a, an AC preparation, but we have academic advisors. I think we need to strengthen those programs. We do need more academic advisors. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. We need more academic advisors. We need more financial aid. We need to extend some of the programs you gave us credit for, and I appreciate mm -hmm. that. But some of those programs are one semester or two semesters, and they work. And we need to find the resources to make them four years long or two years long. So I, I think there are some things, and I, that we're a lot of things are doing right. A lot of things are doing right. The map, the MapWorks program, MapWorks. I got it right. Anything? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. The MapWorks program uh, that Kevin uh, Kevin Cook's doing it for us, and you, many of you are involved in. I think will give us some information this. This semester make a difference. And we've asked Chuck Waring to give us leadership for the overall division of student life, to, to, to play a bigger role in making sure that the second year of MAP, MAP works is stronger than, than the first year. I'm rambling a little bit. I just want to let you know that I know and others know you care. And I appreciate you being here. Yeah, you know, I, I would say what I'm presenting here is, is not meant to, uh, to, to be neutral, actually. I'm just saying these are what the variables that we can do something about. Um, and I think what you, you point out one thing, that there's always going to be situational variables, such as the financial crisis is a situational variable. And in some ways, that's an excuse to maybe look at our financial uh, distribution of money, because we have to. You know? So then it almost forces the issue. So sometimes out of crisis comes the opportunity to make some changes. Yeah, that, that would be Mike Lynch has done more of that, what's going on. I, I was looking, the stuff that I had shown here is mostly freshman, sophomore.
back to her question with regard to only using 8% of our profit to buy it. So it is, it is about 27.5% of our, of our freshman cohort are gone at the end of the second year. We're between 19 and then, and then 8. So 8% of our, our sophomores. She says after that it begins to be more. So it's not necessary. You talk about, Fred, you've asked a challenge to get the data together, and he's doing that for us. But it looks like it is a freshman concern, not so much the sophomore year. And then, it, as we know. Well, it, it, you know, it, it does get, as you say, complex because economic uh, times, uh, more and more students are taking their freshman, sophomore year going to community college, which our opportunity then is to bring them back their junior year, you know, and. and uh, Yep. Uh, we are we are going to do one more thing on that study that Kelly Cox and, and uh, Uni, Uni Kim. I'll just just write in a second, uh, and and that is we're going to add the psychosocial dimensions to uh, the same cohort group. We have the data on them, so that's going to be added in. So we'll see both an academic and situational and personal variables together. Yes, uh, actually, Pat, there are some community college studies being done. Um, there's a really good book out on this topic. You, you've probably read it. I don't know if anybody else read it. It's called Crossing the Finish Line. Mm -hmm. And they take those, they take a lot of these data from a lot of universities and they do <coughs> some interesting things because they've got big enough numbers they can match. They can say, okay, if we have a student who's got this background and this ACT and this, does this factor work? And community colleges, there's a huge section in there on transfer students from community colleges. And what they find, I think, is that people who start out at community colleges may not finish at a, at a regular college, but if somebody actually transfers from a community college to a four-year institution, they have an incredibly high probability of graduating in four years, mm -hmm. not just in six. Um, the other question I would have is, there are a lot of programs, and I know all you people do a lot of stuff, there's not a lot of data that say program X works. And a lot of it, again, is numbers. You have eight people in the program, it takes you 20 years to track enough you know, people to say. But I, what I would ask is at least try to get the data. I mean, you said that leadership studies, those students stay. I have, I'm unaware of the data. If those data are out there, I'd like to see them. Um, the pilots program, I know that the data f from the first year seminar that, that Greg Eisline and, and Emily Lanning did, their first data said it didn't really make a difference. That was a little distressing. Um, so uh, you're going to have to be prepared for some disappointment if, in fact, your program, your favorite thing, doesn't work. You know, do something else. Don't just stay wedded to it, I guess. And that's, that's, I guess that's my message is if you find out that the data say this isn't really doing what you think it's doing, then we don't have enough money to keep doing that. We need to put it someplace else. Yeah, and th that's, that's, that's good. That's important. And, but I remember the circumstances. Uh, Judy, I remember when we had the Kaufman Scholars, and they came in, and most of them did pretty well, but we lost a lot of them because they were the heroes of the family, and they had to go back and help the family with having jobs. So it wasn't anything that was going wrong. It was that they were so torn apart by the needs they had to have this well-functioning kid that was from a very impoverished area. Is that, am I accurate with that? It's the, right, it's the content. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we need to hear what you just said that the, the new air is we need to have the data, that we, we're going to be challenged for asking for more dollars. It's going to be, because we've done this program for a number of years doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be funded or, or funded in a way you'd like to have it funded. I, I think there's an educational leader who's given it very straight. It's a different game in town, particularly as we, as we attempt to try to be intentional. We've never been a school, and you support this, they've taken things to throw up at the ceiling and hope it sticks. We've never been that. We've been as, as intentional as we can be, but we need to make sure what we're doing is in fact making a difference. The other is the context. We talk about the Kaufman Scholars Program. It's a program that was many, many years in the offering, starting in eighth grade. Judy, you were there in the very first moment. Eighth grade uh, in, in an inner city syst uh, school district, in uh, school district in Kansas City, where the Kaufman people said, "We'll pay, we'll pay your entire college experience, every dollar, if you make it through four years of high school with certain expectations. You get into accepted to school, we'll pay everything, and we'll have people on staff 
at that school in your face to make sure you make it through. That we found money isn't necessarily mm -hmm. the answer, that there are a lot of variables. If, even though we are most, more successful than anybody else in the state or in the Midwest with the Kaufman program, thanks to Judy and other individuals, it's still the context in terms of a losing, yeah. losing proposition in some instances. But, but I definitely think we do need to, for example, North Central, we, learning outcomes, you know, they put student affairs and advising and everybody else into learning outcomes, not just the classroom. And yet, I think the only reason to have a learning outcome is because we need to sign at the front end what we're going to have as our outcome, and then we prove it rather than being forced to kind of come up with learning outcomes. So, yeah, I think there's an uh, incentive to do that, and I think there's necessity to do that, and maybe we need a czar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, you know, grants come from people having, you have, to, you have to show what you've done in all grants, so that's why they become important. Dory. Well, I just want to make a comment. I think. Uh, I'm all for keeping track of learning outcomes and progress, et cetera. And when we have new programs like uh, Greg's program uh, for fr incoming freshmen, if we're evaluating those programs just based on a, a year or two years without having it integrated into other programs that are happening on campus to help those students, then I think it's unfair to evaluate those programs and say it's not working, so end it. And I think this is the piece I hear the most from what you're presenting, Fred, that there needs to be the kind of integrated, coordinated work for those, for those students. And, and if, uh, the way we've often been setting up programs, there are isolated individual kinds of programs, or there are isolated programs for certain groups of people, which we struggle as student services offices to network and get things going, but there's it really takes uh, so much effort to do that, that some of the changes across campus will, I think, increase the possibility that we can have this integration, but to evaluate uh, <coughs> programs based on the old system and not about the new system, I think it gives a little bit of a extra pressure uh, for programs that could probably work better if they had the additional input of other connections with other programs. I hope I'm making sense. No, I, th I think, you know, um, you're saying yes, evaluate, look at the outcome, and then integrate, which is even maybe more important. How does this To, uh, to improve, because I hate to see programs kicked out, you know, throwing out the baby with the bathwater kind of a thing, that, that the reason why some programs may not be as effective, and these are all, we're talking about newer programs in particular, is that they're, they're focusing on one aspect, but they really need to be combined with other things in order to make a, an impact. And, we're, and part of the research is always looking at very discrete little pieces. And your research is telling, telling us that you have to look at a complex system, if I'm understanding you correctly. Well, I mean, that's, I think that's the hardest challenge we have here or anywhere, and it's, it's that we are hardware stores and grocery stores, and we're all doing overlapping type things, but how do you destroy that and start over? I mean, that would, it would be almost like we have a tornado and then we rebuild, and so that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, on the other hand, we need to do some of that, and also I think the other issue as we lose resources is that every office has a lot of strategic functions to perform. And so to say to do a couple more that might be useful in the long run to help students and retain is usually adding on. And how do we add on to some people that are already busy? So I, I think that's the other issue that always confronts us. I just wanted to um, add that regarding the um, accountability piece and the reporting structure, I know with, with TRIO, I'm affiliated with the TRIO programs and McNair. McNair is part of TRIO, by the way, and they're federally funded. And of course, we're accountable and we report statistics um, annually to them. We have all kinds of statistics, and I think everyone in here who have programs does have some statistics, so it's just gathering them in one place. Now, as I recall, um, Myra Gordon, Dr. Gordon, has these statistics um, I know with, um, with various programs, we, she was asked for some retention and graduation figures last spring, so we do have that available. So it was just finding them, and with the, uh, we're going to be reporting to the Higher Learning Commission soon, and so those, you know, we will have to make some kind of accountability. And my experience has been um, that we do have these pro program here and there, and no one knows about them. Uh, we're not really corroborating, corroborating like we should. Um, I do my thing over there in Holton Hall and have done some outreach with other programs, so I think uh, doing more corroborating, and I think over the years that's gotten better. 
um, with that. A lot of people get, like McNair Scholars Program, with, which I do, is really for upper class people trying to get, upper class students trying to get them into graduate schools. We get mixed up with developing scholars, which is really a retention program which does undergraduate research for them, you know. And so we work closely with them, McNair does. So we, we have lots and lots of programs, and you know, just yesterday, I guess Dory was telling me she was interacting with a faculty member or somebody, I'm not sure it was you, Dory, and the faculty member said, oh, I didn't know we had a counseling service. I mean, so it's really hard, it's really hard for people that have been here maybe 10 years to even know what's available. And, and, and I probably have been here 30 years, and I can't define every program that's, that's available. So I know that's tough. Fred, I'm very intrigued by the uh, readiness factor. It was such an important accounting for variance factor there. And I wonder how many of us have any kind of training in any kind of a measure in detecting readiness factors mm -hmm. in kids. You know, I came from the therapeutic background under Dory and Fred in assessment of readiness for therapy is key. And I mean, what do we have as far as academic? And I'm thinking about the typical freshman coming out of high school now and their readiness for college versus 30 years ago. How ready were you for college? And the current perfect freshman now may be a 30-year-old person who's lost their job and, and now wants to come to college. They're totally motivated. Their finances are different. And in rethinking who, who are the freshman class, the side effect of that could be really changed numbers, number one, but also a whole new marketing uh, of, of who is ready. And, and how do, but what do you think about getting, what is there for us to learn about academic readiness and how to, how to even begin to think about assessing that? Well, I mean, it, there's, there's, there's readiness on many domains. And, and so, of course, ac academically, people have had placement tests and all these types of things, which is it's very clear on that, how ready they are. But when, when we talk about emotional readiness, we, we have freshmen coming in, and you ask them, oh, why are you here in college? And they say, well, I just thought that was a thing to do. You just left high school, and you went on to college. Well, that readiness isn't very high, <laughs> you know. And, and, and there are ways that we can distinguish motivational readiness and, and maturational readiness you know, uh, advisors and counselors all the time are hearing about someone that's just figuring out how to live on their own. They have never lived on their own before. Uh, and so readiness can be distinguished, but I think, it, I, th I think it could be easily developed. It's just not a real complex type of concept, but it's on multiple dimensions again, which is what does make it more complex. And wouldn't you say something like the clues might maybe be helpful in making that more accelerated measurement because it doesn't actually well, and one of the things I, I want to say quickly about inventories, inventories usually are not answers. Us inventories are usually, usually openings for conversation. It gives you some starting points. And so, yes, you still will have to be, if, uh, you know, how do you take that data and then extract from it something that's personal and useful and makes the next step. And, and that's why I'm, I'm, I am kind of promoting the CLE in a way here. But it can be a, a, a starting point for the discussion about why they have some strengths in some areas and they have some weaknesses in others. And, and when the conversation, you can then help them kind of decide about where they've got the motivation to change some of the areas. And I think that that's, uh, that's an important well. piece about taking them at their readiness level and kind of helping them move uh, ahead. And, and I don't think there's any you know, easy assessment tool that's going to, you just hand it to them and find out what their readiness is. But the CLE seems to be, to me at least, be the closest thing to that process because it identifies several areas that are important for success in school. Uh, and, and it includes the personal well, side. Well, you know, I, I do teach a class on learning. That, you know, it's a graduate class. We, in fact, most of you know we, there's a fairly major program all online uh, with National Association of Advisors on this campus. And we're putting about 300 advisors through the program at any point in time. And uh, I ask them to do an assessment and, and do a learning profile for themselves. And I give them a bank of, how many is it, Julie, about six assessments that they have to take plus do a personal history. And they put that together and build their own profile of their history, their motivation, their learning style, their personality style, their uh, CLE, <laughs> and, their, and, and then they have to digest that and say, this is who I am and this is how it affects me. 
So um, you can do it, but it is multifaceted. It's a process. And uh, again, I, there's no, what, what I try to communicate right now, the publisher that I'm working with wants to know how what we're doing compares with what these five or six other manuals. And the five or six other manuals out there are kind of total packages. This is what you do for time management. This is what you do for this. This is what you do for that. And I said, well, what we're doing is providing stimulus. And uh, I use the metaphor, it's, it's, like, uh, it's like cooking. You want a recipe that gives you general ingredients, but if you're really good, if you're Julia Child, you give a smidget of this, a pinch of that, and you adapt it to your taste. And you have to have that capability. So what I'm trying to communicate is, you don't put people in pigeonholes. You give data and you help them find out what it is that they're doing and how they are acting and why that could be improved and how you could do certain things to make that. So uh, people want formulas that are very discreet. Uh, I have students still in my class, even though I say there's lots of ways you can do this. Uh, ask me how many pages, how many words, and do you use what type of font, and that's the only way they can conform, perform what they think I am asking to do. And I say, no, that's not what it's about. And so that's the difficulty. <laughs> and that's the whole educational problem, isn't it, <laughs> when you get that right down to it? How do you become a critical learner, critical thinker, and so forth? Time for a couple more, <laughs> and that's it. You don't get that old. <laughs> it's, it's age. It's age. <laughs> I'm looking at their work and I'm thinking, wow, there should be a way to identify what the division of student life wants to accomplish for students as a division. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how that might inform the kind of assessment that we do division wide or within. Ooh, ugh. Or, or within our own departments and offices. Wow. <laughs> you do want a czar <laughs> putting this together. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's a good question. And, uh, you know, it is hard for us to get out of our bailiwick. I mean, the one thing that's good about our division and even good about our university is um, in many ways, even though we're 23,500 students, and I don't know how many faculty and staff now, but uh, we still are fairly much a small town. We, we still communicate. That's the good news. The bad news is we really probably do need to have a three-day retreat just to understand where we're going and why we're going there and how we can go there together. A or, you know, maybe a three-year process. I don't know, but it, it's, it's, it has to be willing to do all of that, and that's not easy. <laughs> and so I don't have the solution. Uh, and you know, and who does the best job in terms of other institutions? I mentioned community colleges. You know, they're kind of younger, more flexible, and they have to be adaptable, so they kind of do that a little more frequently. Um, but, but we are established, and that's the good news. But on the other hand, it's hard to change our establishment. So I don't know as I've answered that, because I don't have the answer. That's, I think we're about running out of time. And, you know, last words. Yeah, I guess that's what we call a community of learners, but those, those are just words. <laughs> How do we get there? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>